Hey, I'm Chris. Thank you for checking in and welcome to my channel. You know, just like a lot of you guys, I follow a bunch of different car channels on YouTube. Some of those channels are big, some are small. But recently, one of the big dogs on YouTube made a video about the different cars that he's owned since high school. And that video got me thinking about the different cars I've owned too during the same period of time. Now, some of those cars I've had, they were pretty cool, some not so cool, some memorable, some really I just wanted to forget about. And strangely, a few of them are free too. Now, it took me a little bit of time to pull together the documentation and create a list of these different cars, and I was really quite surprised by the number. There was 29 vehicles on this list, which made up 21 cars, four trucks and SUVs, three vans, and a motorcycle. Now, I'm not boasting when I say 29, and frankly, I'm a little embarrassed to share that. The whole purpose and the whole meaning of my channel here on YouTube has always been to memorialize my cars and share my journeys and some of the car stories as well. And that's exactly what this video is about. Plus, it may give you a glimpse a little bit into who I am and really why my channel is called East Coast Classics. So, let's get going on the very first car. All right, junior year in high school, for $2,000, I buy a 1963 Chevrolet Biscayne, seafoam green, two-door post, dog dish hubcaps, and probably the most highly optioned Chevy Biscayne in the history of all Biscaynes with a 283 V8, a power glide, posi traction rear, power steering, power brakes, air conditioning, and a power bench seat. Rebuilt probably everything on that car at least twice over the eight years that I've owned it through high school and college and thereafter. Ended up changing the color to a 1959 Chevy color called Cameo Coral. Terrible color match, terrible shine, but a fantastic driving car. But I eventually sold it to buy the next car on the list, a 1958 Dodge Coronet. Now this Coronet I found in a used car lot down in Chattanooga while I was driving through on vacation. The whole scene with the beam of light shining down on it, the angels came out and sang to me, and I had to buy it. Bought the car on the spot, didn't know how to ship it back, got it figured out, and that's when I began a year after year project on the restoration on this car. Now each year I would tackle a new project. One year was the engine rebuild, next year was the transmission rebuild, suspension, chrome on the front, chrome on the back, paint. And this is when I met Paul for the first time as well, and he repainted and fixed the bodywork on the car. Now, during the restoration project of the car, there was a whole bunch of other cars that I wanted to have in my life, but all my car money was wrapped up in that Dodge. And so I finally got that Dodge to a point where it was in pristine condition. Every aspect of it looked showroom new. And that's when I reached the point also that it just wasn't fun anymore. Having that car so nice and so clean made me fret every time it rained, every time the kids got in with dirty or sticky fingers. And it just wasn't fun. I just, I lost the enjoyment and the passion I had for cars at that time. And that's when I made the commitment to myself to sell that Dodge, take the $20,000 that I made on the sale and put that money into a bucket list of all these other cars I've always wanted to have. And that's exactly what I started at that point. And that is why that list of 29 cars is so surprisingly large to me. So after that Dodge sold, it was interesting. I'm at work, I'm in corporate life, the corporate attorney throws me a set of keys and says, I know you're a car guy. I've got this old Mercedes 300D diesel. I don't want it anymore. Have the keys, have the car. She tosses me the keys, doesn't want money for it, just wants the car out of her life. I go down to the parking lot. I see this really clean, low mileage, 115,000 mile white four-door sedan, 300 diesel sitting there, blue interior, just wanting to be loved uncared for, unkept, and it was mine. Now, at that time, I was living in an apartment, on street parking only, had no place to store it, but I took the car, enjoyed it for a few weeks or months, and really, I ended up just giving it back to her. I had no place to put it. It was too much of a burden for me. It was her car, never transferred the title, and it just gave it back to her, and we called it even. After that Mercedes, I ended up buying a 2004 Toyota 4Runner, and that's my family car, and it still is my family car today, 15 years later. After that, I don't know what I was thinking when I stepped up and bought a 2004 Ford Mustang GT convertible. I don't know what phase I was in. I don't know how to explain it, but it was a fun car, had it for the summer, and then moved on. Thereafter, I ended up buying a 1972 Mercury Colony Park station wagon. Now, I looked high and low for a really nice rust-free station wagon. I figured the best place to go and to search would be Southern California in the desert area. I found this Colony Park. It was in San Diego. It spent its whole life in San Diego. It was sold new in San Diego. I figured, you know what, that's the car to buy. I buy it, get it shipped over to Delaware for $900, and it was in terrible condition. All the pop metal was rusted, the paint was a wreck. Now the engine, it had a 429, and that was rebuilt. 
I had the interior seats recovered, had a third row face-to-face, -face, third row seating, which was pretty cool. Enjoyed that car for about a year, eventually sold it, and it went out to a gentleman in Germany. After the Colony Park, I picked up a 1968 Imperial. It came out of Minnesota. That was just a fantastic, beautiful driving car. Drove that thing all over the place every day. It was, in my, it was a nearly daily driver for me. Had the most fun with that car. The kids enjoyed it, I enjoyed it. And it was just a phase, it lasted for a year. And, and that car moved on to a gentleman in Dallas, Texas. After the Imperial, I found on eBay a 1968 International Harvester Travel All. Paid $3,400 for it. Two large basketball size dents in the rear. Had Paul bang them out and repaint the, the rear quarters. Probably the most smoothest riding truck of that era. Had torsion bar front suspension. Had a four speed transmission with first gear being an underdrive. The thing was incredibly powerful and durable and reliable and just a fantastic car. That truck originally came out of Santa Fe, New Mexico and completely rust free. And that was my first experience in taking a rust free pristine truck out of the desert and bring it into the humid mid-Atlantic region. Within a year of bringing that truck here, I started getting rust spots in the cow and the quarter panels and the rockers as well. I made the decision at that point, despite how much I loved that truck, it had to go to somebody else who had a garage who could take better care of it because at that time we had moved to another house that had driveway parking but still no garage. After that travel all, I went to Niagara Falls for $6,000 and came home with, with this Corvair Greenbrier van, which I've documented in other videos. After the Greenbrier, I was cruising through Daily Lister. I came across an ad in Ontario, Oregon for a 1973 Oldsmobile Custom Cruiser station wagon, probably the pinnacle of station wagon design for the time with three rows of seating, a 455, luxury and comfort to the tops. Fantastic original car that I brought back to life. It's been 30 years or so sitting in the barn. After I got it shipped here to Delaware, I brought it back to life and mechanicals and cosmetics as well. It's a fantastic car. Bought that car for $3,500. Spent a year with it and ended up selling it for 9000 Now, I made a nice profit on that Oldsmobile wagon. And when I started buying these cars, the whole premise was to take that $20,000 that I earned from that Dodge, preserve it by not losing money on making other purchases. Now, that Oldsmobile and the profit was pretty nice and that gave me a lot of confidence. So I went into this next car feeling really good about myself. I bought a 1967 Olds Tornado, Paid 10 grand for it, which was top dollar for a very nice driver condition car. I bought it sight unseen, came out of Tampa Bay. Once it arrived, immediately I knew right away that cosmetically it was fantastic, but mechanically it was missing something. Ultimately, I found out that through the engine rebuilt that it had prior to me buying it, the compression was dropped from 10 and a half down to eight and a half. A giant can was put in it. The car wouldn't run well at all. Car had a, a miss to it. It just didn't perform the way it was supposed to. Plus the transmission was swapped out instead of the original switch pitch torque converter transmission. A standard 400 was installed. Everything mechanically about the car just let me down and left me disappointed. I ended up selling that car, lost $3,000, but sold it to a guy here locally. The next car is another freebie that I got. It's a 1979 Pontiac Firebird. It's one of the cars that I regret selling. Ended up keeping the car, didn't do anything with it. It was given to me by my accountant. He bought the car brand new. He had it sitting in his, his driveway for years and years. He put a new engine in it and transmission years prior to me getting it. He didn't want it anymore. He gave me the keys, gave me the title, said it's yours. I kept the car. I had other projects going on at the time. I didn't do anything with it. It ended up sitting in my driveway for four or five months until I had enough of it and I ended up selling it for $1,500 to somebody local. And that's when I picked up 1971 Dodge van. It was a B200, three quarter ton, fully customized in the 70s. I added wheels and side pipes and some other cosmetic touches. Super low 19,000 original miles. The thing was an outstanding driving and looking van. Enjoyed that for a year before I moved on to the next one which was another free car, a 1992 Volvo 940 Turbo. This is a friend of a friend situation where they knew I enjoyed cars. They had this car sitting in the driveway. They didn't want it anymore. Gave me the keys and the title and said, take it for nothing. Now, strangely, that car has so many things wrong with it, but none of them affect the way it drives. I've put a few bucks into it over the years, and frankly, I still have that car. I gave it to my dad. He needed something to run around to Home Depot with and run to the store with. And so he's been driving it every day for the past five years now too. Now I keep thinking I want to do a video on this car. Just an old school style drive that's reliable and dependable. The thing starts and drives fine. 
but cosmetically it's just poor, it's lacking. And I'm also thinking about maybe sending it to Mako and seeing what kind of paint job I can get out of it. We'll see how that plays out. The next is my very first cop car, a 1997 Crown Vic Police Interceptor Aero model. Had the car for a year, paid $2,200 for it. Had 69,000 miles when I bought it. I put about 10,000 miles on it over the Then comes the 1965 Dodge pickup truck, a D100, a half ton. Had a lot of patina, a lot of style to it. Had a Uteline style bed with the flares and the step. I ended up lowering it, putting white walls on it, refinishing the interior. It was a great truck, owned it for a year. Bought it for 4,200, sold it for 5,500. Uh, again, about a thousand dollars profit after after what I put into it. And then a 73 Imperial, baby blue, four door, really one of the first videos I made and when I started my channel. Terrible narrative, terrible video, terrible work that I put into it, but it was my first attempt and it was my first try at making videos on YouTube. After that, a 61 DeSoto, four door hardtop. Loved this car, loved it ever since the first time I saw pictures of it in magazines when I was a teenager. Finally was able to get a, my own 61 DeSoto. Found it somewhat locally, about three hours from here in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Enjoyed the car for about a year. Ended up selling it, went to a gentleman in Czech Republic. While I had the DeSoto, it was also my dad's 70th birthday. I wanted to do something special and fun for dad. Back in 1971, he bought a brand new Honda 350 Scrambler. I went out and found a bike just like the one he had. Had Paul paint the tank, paint the side covers, replace a bunch of parts on it and gifted it to my dad on his birthday. Now, strangely, I've been approached by one of these TV shows on True TV. They wanted to buy that video and they wanted to include it in one of their upcoming episodes, but I really never followed through with it and wasn't really interested in losing the rights to the video. And then comes the four Crown Vicks that I bought recently that you know the story of, sold three. One is camo wrap that I still drive today. Then the Caprice PPV, I paid $7,000 for that, bought that at auction. A 1985 Chrysler Executive Limo. That car's been sitting, it hasn't been, I haven't done much of anything with that car since I bought it. I put maybe 200 miles on it in the year that I've had it. And really it just sits around, takes space. I haven't been doing anything with it, haven't had any fun with it. Ended up putting a new carburetor on it, pulled out the old Makuni carburetor, put a Weber on. The car still sits. I just need to do something with it. More than likely I'll just sell it and get whatever I can for it. I paid 3300 for that car, and frankly, at this point, I could care less what I get for it. It just needs to go. Then the 76 Dodge B200 that I started to restore. That's the van that Paul was painting. Ultimately, he passed away while doing the paint job on that car. Lost my passion, sold it to Mark down in Tennessee, and he's got it now working on it. Then the 2008 Chevy Tahoe PPV and the 2009 Dodge Avenger that I bought for my son. So there you have it. That's the timeline of my car journey from high school until today. Now, just like the limo, how it has to go, some of these other cars are gonna to have to go too. It's time to rotate the stock. I think the Caprice may be next and maybe the Dodge Avenger as well. Now, this isn't the end of my car journey. In fact, I get a hunch that this may be just the beginning. There's still cars on my bucket list that I wanna pick up. A few cars from AMC, for instance, like the Matador and the Gremlin and Pacer. Some newer cars from Mercedes, the C63 and E55, for instance. I have a hunch that this is just a new phase in the car stories and car journeys of East Coast classics. So I appreciate you sticking around. I hope you enjoyed it. And as always, thanks so much for watching.